Thank you, David, and uh, thanks to the organizers of this meeting for inviting me. It's not a meeting that I've uh, attended in the past, uh, so uh, it's a new experience for me. And I apologize also if we have some audiovisual uh, challenges here. So what I'm going to try to uh, talk about today is uh, something really quite different, from, I think, from the theme of this meeting, which is therapeutic de uh, de therapeutics development. Um, <clears throat> my lab for the last 30 plus years has been focused on trying to understand uh, nicotinic function in the brain, uh, how uh, nicotinic receptors mediate cognitive performance and cognitive function, and then how we might use that therapeutically. And so we've explored and continue to explore a number of possibilities in this area, and I'm going to just highlight a few of them today. Um, and so, and tell you a little bit about sort of our ongoing, past and ongoing work in this area. So, uh, I'm going to focus particularly on disorders of the aging brain. Um, and this is because this is really the area where we've had sort of the most success in terms of understanding nicotinic receptors, how they function, how they're relevant to cognitive uh, functioning, and then how we might use them therapeutically. We know that um, cognitive performance declines with normal aging. Uh, and this is accelerated in, in um, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we know that, for example, there's a, a fairly linear decline in the speed of cognitive processing uh, beginning in uh, actually your 20s. And then by the time you get to my age, you know, it becomes more uh, marked. We also know that there are other kinds of differences and changes that occur changes in unisensory functioning and increasing dependence on multisensory integration. We have difficulties controlling the focus of attention. We have changes in how the hemispheres of the brain uh, encode and retrieve information. And, we, and, uh, and one that I'll highlight later in the talk particularly is that we shift more of our cortical processing forward in the brain as we age to compensate for some of these differences. Uh, a lot of, we believe that a lot of these changes, not all of them, but some of them at least, are related to changes in the brain cholinergic system. And what I've illustrated in the top left of this uh, slide is a cartoon of the five, four or five um, core cholinergic nuclei in the basal forebrain and their uh, ascending projections to the cortex. We also know that a cholinergic receptors come in two basic flavors uh, called nicotinic and muscarinic. They were, uh, th these, were these names were assigned because of the alkaloids that were used to identify and separate them. I'm not going to talk about our work in muscarinic receptors today, but just on nicotinic side, nicotinic receptors are ion channels. Uh, they are relatively fast receptor systems and they are primarily modulatory. They don't for the most part, communicate information directly from cell to cell, but they act to modulate or amplify signals that are coming through uh, from other neurotransmitter systems. One of the things we know about the cholinergic system in the brain is that it's a top-down and bottom-up uh, attentional modulation system. So your ability to attend to what I'm saying right here at this moment is based in part on the top-down modulation of cholinergic fibers that allow you to direct the focus of your attention to me and to, and to the screen or to what I'm saying. But we also know that it functions as a bottom-up system where if there's an alarm that goes off in the hallway, you will uh, essentially disengage from me and shift your attention to that signal. And that is also permitted by an operating cholinergic nervous system. And it appears that basically all information processing in the brain is modulated by cholinergic fibers to one degree or another. And a decline in the integrity of that system will result in robust uh, impairments of not only of attention but also of other cognitive functions. We, uh, we published a hypothesis in 2011, my colleague and I, uh, that suggested that essentially the attentional system is at the core of uh, higher cortical functions, 
and uh, that the cholinergic basal forebrain supports that system, and that in middle age, that system essentially is at the peak of its ability to function, mainly because the cholinergic system can upregulate its activity to support that system. And in normal aging, we believe that um, that that system reaches the limit of, of its ability to support that uh, attentional processes which permits the operation of working memory and long-term memory. And in dementia or dementing disorders, that system becomes frankly uh, diseased and therefore cannot support uh, the attention process it needs, the attention expands, and that unfortunately results in decline in cognitive performance. So we think essentially that the cholinergic system and the nicotinic system as part of that is a core uh, feature of your cognitive ability to regulate uh, cortical activity. All right. Now what do we know about this system? We know that the cholinergic basal forebrain, the, the core of that system, if you will, is impacted both in normal aging and in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these results show you that uh, there are, are declines in the number and size of the cells in that area of the brain and uh, the color-coded uh, things which are a little hard to see on on the slide show you that you can actually now, we can actually now measure the size of these structures on MRI scans and we can see that decline both in normal aging and a more rapid decline in uh, mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. And in the lower right hand corner is um, PET scans which actually image the receptor system directly using radio ligands and these show that these systems deteriorate as well both with uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, mild Alzheimer's disease as well. So there is a, a rapid decline as these systems are attacked uh, by uh, neurodegenerative disease. We also know that nicotinic cholinergic receptors are specifically lost in both in, to some degree in normal aging, but particularly in Alzheimer's disease. And in these two uh, studies, um, one by my colleague David Saltzer at UCLA, uh, showed that in the bright, the bright colors on the right are related to a change in receptor number uh, using the uh, PET ligand 2FA and in the center one also with 2FA looking at a different projection of the brain uh, showing decline in uh, the lower panel in an Alzheimer's disease, you can see the reduction in color compared to the upper panel. So we know that those receptor systems are lost and that impacts cognitive, but we didn't know whether, whether that would impact cognitive function. We also think that nicotinic receptor dysfunction is actually directly linked to the Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, we know that the abnormal proteins in Alzheimer's disease directly can interact with nicotinic receptors in the brain, and there may be uh, actually di uh, direct sort of uh, um, impairing effects of these abnormal peptides and proteins. So one of the things that we tried to do starting back in the 1990s was begin to ask the question, well, if nicotinic receptors are lost, what is the impact actually on cognitive function? And we use a model uh, where we would take a nicotinic receptor antagonist drug, which happened to be an old antihypertensive that was developed in the 1950s, but would actually penetrate the brain, and use it to try to examine what temporarily blocking nicotinic receptor function does. And what we found in a series of papers over a course of uh, several years was that if you block nicotinic receptor function gradually, you actually impair new learning. And so this is a graph of three different populations of young normals, elderly normals, and Alzheimer's disease patients showing that as you gradually increase the dose of nicotinic receptor antagonists, you can actually uh, impair learning, uh, learn the number of errors that they make on this novel, on this nonverbal learning task increases. We later showed that you can uh, model that with verbal learning as well. So in this um, in this slide, we, we showed that uh, 
uh, nicotinic receptor function uh, is important for new verbal learning as well and that patients with Alzheimer's disease are much more sensitive to that effect uh, because they have less nicotinic receptor function to rely on. And in fact, if you block a nicotinic receptor function, you can actually make the learning rate negative. So you can actually impair learning to the point where people forget information faster than they're learning it. So nicotinic receptor function seems to be critical for new learning as well as uh, attention. Now, I mentioned earlier that we are very interested in this, uh, one of the aging related changes in the brain, which is the so-called PASA effect, posterior anterior shift in aging. And this is the idea that was developed by uh, Robert Cabeza and other people, that, the, um, that there's a shift in cortical activity forward in the brain as we age. This is a normal phenomenon and appears to represent compensation for changes in cortical processing that occur. And this is non-task specific. It occurs across cognitive domains. So it's not just one particular task. And we wanted to see if we could model this with a nicotinic antagonist function. And what we showed in the mid-2000s is that by blocking nicotinic receptor function in, and putting people in the scanner, we were able to reproduce this increase in cortical activity forward in the brain. And in this paper, we actually reproduced the PASA effect. So it does seem like that, that intact nicotinic function seems to be important for manifesting um, uh, the compensation that is necessary in normal aging and perhaps in disorders like Alzheimer's disease. And so it, uh, even, even when you maintain performance, if you block nicotinic receptor function, you can actually push cortical processing forward. We, we actually showed that you can do this both in working memory, which is very frontal lobe dependent, as well as episodic memory or memory for uh, uh, recent events, which is dependent on the hippocampus, which is a major structure that's damaged in Alzheimer's disease. And we showed also in this paper that uh, we increase uh, cortical activity uh, especially for words that are well remembered uh, in the inferior temporal gyrus, the anterior hippocampus, and other structures as well. And so we were able to dissociate in this particular study encoding and retrieval. So we can dissociate when words are, or when information is stored, and then when it's brought back into conscious memory. And nicotinic receptor function, again, seems to be involved in both of those processes. And, and finally, um, we actually uh, looked at a group of individuals who reported changes in their cognitive functioning with even in middle age. And what we did was we compared those to individuals who were matched but did not report these changes. And what we, show is, what we showed in this paper in 2013 was that these individuals actually kind of reproduced this effect. So they look like they already have a changed cholinergic system because they're using more cortical resources to do the same amount of processing that people who don't report cognitive change. And so essentially, we think this is a sort of resource problem. And, uh, and then so now dialing the clock back, going back almost uh, into the late 1980s, we decided to look at, well, if you block nicotinic receptor function and you impair cognition, what if you stimulate nicotinic receptors? And in this study, which we published back in the dark ages, uh, before cellophane and the ballpoint pen, we had to give nicotine intravenously because there was no other way at that time that there was no other alternative nicotine source. So we actually made it into an intravenous injection. And we showed that there was a, a dose response curve. It was rather steep, but if you pick the dose precisely, we could see an improvement in cognitive functioning in these Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, and later on, we were the first group to actually look at a novel nicotinic agonist, which at the time was called ABT-418. And we were able to show, again, that uh, single doses of, of these uh, agonists, of these nicotinic agonists, would improve cognitive function, even in patients with Alzheimer's disease.
Uh, my colleague Ed Levin and uh, Wilson in Minnesota showed in, a, in a, a couple of smaller studies, small studies that they had, they were able to see gradual improvements in cognitive function if they gave nicotine to patients with either mild memory loss or what was then called uh, uh, age-associated memory impairment uh, by giving nicotine, uh, usually by patch form over the course of several weeks. Uh, and so that also suggested that there might be some ability to see chronic improvements as well. So it, beginning in the early 2000s, we uh, convinced the National Institute on Aging uh, in the U.S. to give us um, some money to run a pilot study of stimulating chronically nicotinic receptor function in patients with mild memory loss and what we call MCI, which is the precursor condition to Alzheimer's disease. And this was a pretty simple study design. It was basically a parallel group. We assigned half the patients to, MC, uh, to placebo patch for six months and a half to uh, a nicotine patch. We titrated them up over the course of about a month, and we simply left them on the patch and measured them, their performance periodically. And these were individuals who were in their early 70s, uh, early to mid 70s, um, and interestingly, their genetics, we were able to genotype them and found that about 40% of them had one of the high risk genes for uh, population risk factor genes for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the safety of this uh, was really quite interesting and, and remarkable. These were all non-smokers. Most of them had had no history of smoking. And what we found was contrary to what everyone expected, including the FDA, um, that nicotine actually lowers blood pressure. It doesn't raise blood pressure. Um, it lowers it. And, um, and it seems to be quite safe in non-smokers to be administered for long periods of time, even in elderly non-smokers. Uh, I remember when I showed some of this uh, blood pressure data at the FDA a few years ago, I remember one of the uh, um, reviewers said, you know, I, I just can't believe this. And I said, well, I'm sorry, it's just the data. I mean, <laughs> I don't care if you don't believe it, but it's the data. So um, basically, uh, and also there's weight loss. So patients lost about two kilograms on average, but interestingly, they stabilize fairly rapidly after that. And we have, this data actually runs out to a year. We had um, some individuals who continued open label for up to a year and they don't lose any more weight. And the placebo group, once it crosses over, also has a weight reduction and a blood pressure reduction as well. And so whether those two things are tied, we're not entirely sure. Uh, there may be a change in weight, or change in blood pressure because of the change in weight, but I think you can notice that the weight change happens slower than the blood pressure change, so we think it's uh, potentially positive, or potentially a different effect. There were no serious adverse events that are really secondary to nicotine throughout this trial, uh, and so it was really very safe. And what we saw was a, quite an interesting signal. Um, we saw enhancements in attention in, in, and in several aspects of memory over the course of six months. One of the things that we had been warned about or concerned about by our reviewers was that, oh, you'll see a cognitive benefit, but it'll rapidly fade. And that was not the case. So the actual, the actual cognitive benefit actually really comes all the way out to six months and in fact actually peaks there in, for some um, parameters. And so we saw both um, attentional improvements as measured by our primary outcome variables such as uh, the continuous performance task and also even verbal, verbal uh, learning as well. Now not, not everything improved. I should be careful here. It's not a panacea, but there were definitely marked improvements in that. And interestingly, there did seem to be a genotype interaction here. So we were able to look at a subgroup analysis to look at individuals who had one, at least one allele of the APOE4 risk factor gene for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there was a stronger effect, actually, in the APOE4 positive individuals. Now, so okay, so that was great. That was published in 2012 in Neurology. And the question is, well, where do we go next? Well, one of the things we know is that chronic nicotine upregulates nicotinic receptors. 
and sensitizes those uh, that remain. And those, so there are more nicotinic receptors after you chronically take nicotine. This is uh, data from Julie Miwa's lab looking at rat data, but we presume the same thing happens in humans. And so what we've now done is we've now um, launched the MIND trial. And the MIND trial stands for Memory Improvement with Nicotine Dosing. Uh, this is now a national study in the United States. We have 32 U.S. sites so far. Um, we're, uh, my colleagues at the University of Southern California are helping to coordinate this uh, with me. Uh, and it's a major project to give nicotine to patients with mild memory loss for up to two years of treatment. And so we really want to see if we can make uh, a substantial difference in cognitive performance, which translates into functional outcomes. We will also be looking at the progression of neurodegenerative disease, although that's not our primary outcome. And so this is primarily funded by the National Institute on Aging in the United States with some help from the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. Uh, again, it's pretty simple design. Um, we're randomizing people to nicotine or placebo, but this time we're also going to be collecting spinal fluid uh, from a subset. We will be brain imaging a subset to look for neural network changes and spinal fluid mar biomarkers. Um, we're going to be uh, following these patients closely and we're using a multimodal uh, set of treatment uh, effect and biomarker measures to look at everything from cognitive assessment to clinical outcomes and biomarkers of disease progression as well as looking at nicotine metabolism as a possible biomarker as well. So Rachel Tyndale at the University of Toronto is working with us to help us understand how individual genetics and nicotine metabolism may impact treatment. I'm going to say a few words then about two other disorders that we're looking at for nicotinic stimulation. One of those is Down syndrome. Down syndrome individuals live, as you know, uh, uh, are living much longer than they used to. Uh, it's not uncommon now to see 50 or even 60 year old Down syndrome individuals because all their cardiovascular problems usually get fixed in childhood. But they do show a pattern of early aging, uh, rapid aging, and they also all develop uh, Alzheimer's disease disease, or almost all of them do, because of the uh, trisomy 21, because the protein, one of the proteins that's involved in Alzheimer's disease is coded for on chromosome 21. And so they lose uh, cholinergic function and cholinergic markers, and we decided to take a brief look at whether nicotine could make an impact on these patients, but not when they're becoming, not when they're demented, but when they're, but, but when they're starting to show early behavioral change, which is hard to determine in patients with Down syndrome. Because they can't do regular cognitive tests, we decided to use EEG and ERP as a way of examining changes in brain function. So we use an array of, uh, of uh, recording electrodes for cortical ERP processing. We use a passive memory task that doesn't involve any necessary response from the patient. And we simply ask, we're essentially interrogating the brain as to whether it's noticing uh, things that are repeated that are displayed. Displayed. And what we found preliminarily is that nicotine essentially, uh, or up to a month of treatment with nicotine, essentially restores the brain's ability to distinguish novel from repeated items. And so uh, this uh, change in um, the cortic, this is the P300 curve. Basically, my colleague Sasha Key has shown previously that as individuals with Down syndrome age, they lose this uh, essentially uh, ability to detect a repeated stimulus. And nicotine, this is the yellow line on these graphs, essentially one, uh, one month of treatment uh, essentially restores that novelty, the brain's ability to detect novelty, which is very, or, excuse me, to detect repeated items, which is quite interesting. So we are now moving forward to try to expand this. This was an only an N of five individuals, uh, but we're, um, uh, with the exception of this one, th one individual. So I wanted to show you this. This was the youngest individual in our cohort, and he was, only he was a high-functioning individual in his mid-20s, 
And when my RA, uh, my research assistant, came and showed me this data, she said, well, this, I've got bad news for you. This, this guy actually got worse with treatment. And I said, well, no, that's actually quite interesting because, in fact, he's a high-functioning individual and nicotine actually made him worse. And that was a hypothesis that we predicted some 25 years ago, was that if you're functioning at the top of your game, nicotinic stimulation or flogging your nicotinic receptors with nicotine is not going to improve improve your cognitive function, but will actually make it worse. And that was what happened in this one particular individual. And so we were pleased, uh, I was pleased that this actually suggested there was some specificity to the effect of, of nicotine on cognitive function. And finally, I just want to touch on some work that my colleague Warren Taylor has been doing in our, in our center, where he's been focusing on late life depression which is another cognitive disorder. We believe that depression involves an impairment of, of reward mechanisms and cognitive control networks. And he's been exploring that whether nicotine might have a role in enhancing those cognitive control networks, which would help alleviate depression. And in this model that he developed, uh, essentially, nicotinic stimulation may enhance the activity of central executive uh, networks in the brain, uh, change the, uh, uh, the, the functioning of salience networks and default mode networks in the brain, which may lead to changes in the bias to negative stimuli and improve uh, mood and cognition. And so he, uh, this paper has just recently been published. This was an open label pilot study looking at late life depression patients with transdermal nicotine. And what you're seeing here is a robust decline in depression scores over the course of 12 weeks. Now I emphasize this is an open label study, so it has all the caveats of that. Um, but it was certainly uh, very interesting for hypothesis generating ideas. And, it, and according to my colleague uh, Warren Taylor, this is the most robust improvement in an open label study that he'd seen in 20 years. And so we think there's a strong possibility that this may be helpful in an augmenting strategy. And we've actually uh, put in a large proposal to the NIMH the National Institute of Mental Health to uh, actually carry this forward and look at brain imaging during this process. And we can also use EEG to look at uh, target engagement. And in this uh, task, uh, we also use the, or in this study, we also use the ERP tasks. And we were able to see shifts in essentially cortical power and, the, and power across different frequencies that suggested that we were hitting the target in a way that uh, would allow us to then use this as a biomarker going forward. So then in summary, where we're going next with this is we're really focusing on neuronal networks because the brain at its core is not only a series of chemical systems, but it's a series of neuronal networks. And really, that's where we think the action is in terms of understanding drug treatment effects, is that we have to be able to actually look at how these neuronal networks get altered in the presence of disease and in treatment. And so we're now focusing our efforts going forward on using neural networks within the brain as a target for drug development and nicotinic enhancement. And so we've evolved from a primary focus just on memory or cognitive performance to a focus on neural networks. And so uh, we really have kind of come to this model here uh, this relatively simple model that alterations in neur neural network functioning will predict whether a drug treatment like nicotine will enhance cognitive function. And we think it's particularly relevant to syndromes that represent accelerated cognitive aging. So we are also exploring nicotinic treatments in uh, disorders as diverse as HIV, chronic HIV infection, which lead to cognitive impairment, and even things like post-chemotherapy-related cognitive decline. All of these may be impacted by enhancing nicotinic receptor function, which actually may be orthogonal to underlying disease processes. <laughs> So uh, I just want to impress uh, upon you also the idea that this is an intervention that has to be done early. So we've seen this curve before, uh, that nicotinic stimulation en enhances cognitive function. Uh, if you're on a low end, see if I can get my little video, well, no, 
can someone click on that and just maybe get that movie to operate for me? There we go. So the idea that the upside down U-shaped function uh, operates is, is I think well understood at this point, that if your functioning is at, the, at, at a low point, nicotinic receptor uh, stimulation or cholinergic stimulation will enhance it. But now if you make this, ax, this graph three-dimensional, you can see that as neurodegeneration occurs, the dynamic range of this response declines. And so this is why cholinergic therapies fail ultimately in Alzheimer's disease, because the dynamic range that they can operate on declines. And so we really want to intervene as early as we can in these, especially in degenerative disorders, so that we can essentially maximize the impact of nicotinic therapies. So I'll just end here and just suggest that cognitive impairment that is secondary to a brain disorder and aging is a particular target for nicotinic stimulation. And these include just some of the ones that I've listed here. And so such treatment may be symptomatic. Um, we don't know if it will be a disease modifying. That's a separate question that I don't have time to go into here. But there's some evidence that nicotinic receptor stimulation may be disease modifying as well. Uh, but it certainly can be symptomatic and, and also improve quality of life, if not quantity. So I'll just uh, list a few of my collaborators and a few of the many funding partners that we've had over the years in some of this work, including the National Institutes on Aging, the Alzheimer's Association, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, and many other uh, individuals and foundations as well. So I'll stop there and thank you very much.